Welcome to beginner's guide for Pathfinder Red of the Righteous You Ultimate Bastards. Pathfinder is a very complex game and there are tons of stuff to talk about, but I will try to do this as briefly as possible by focusing on most important stuff to understand basics of this system and what game focuses on and, and how to overcome that challenge. Things like mythic paths and crusade management are not gonna be in this video. I am not overly familiar with the Dungeons and Dragons system, but I do understand the most important thing to get attack roll and armor class as high as possible. By opening character screen you can see all boosts by hovering over both of those, but not everything stacks. Thankfully game warns about redundant items and boosts, but there is needed understanding on what stacks and what doesn't to know what to pick ahead when it comes to spells, feats and items. Two points into main attack attributes which are strength and dexterity add plus one to attack roll. Note that spells that have description ranged attack or ranged touch attack use dexterity plus basic attack bonus for attack roll. There are many other ways of increasing attack roll besides through attribute. Weapons with plus one plus 2 and higher modifiers add that modifier to attack roll and damage, so almost always prioritize using such weapons. It pays off investing in them. Another way is through buffs and accessories. However, be careful when using buffs. Read the description what type of attack bonus it provides. For example, look at attack roll with this character. Basic attack bonus that depends on class plus dexterity modifier which is applied to melee attack only if you have weapon finesse feat and weapon that supports weapon finesse plus bonus from accessory. One of best and most often used team buffing spells is bless which adds plus one morale bonus to attack roll among other things. On top of that I will cast Aid, which also grants plus one morale bonus to attack roll. However, they don't stack. Why? Because bonuses with same descriptor don't stack. That would in this case mean morale bonus from both spells. Bonuses from different sources do stack, so try to mix buffing spells and abilities. In this case I have cast Burst of Glory which adds plus one sacred bonus and Haste which adds plus one stacking bonus on any other buff because it doesn't have specific descriptor. Just says plus one bonus which means it stacks with everything. This principle of stacking and non-stacking can be applied to armor class attributes and saving throws too. For example, if you have Amulet of Natural Armor and cast Bark Skin, those two natural armor bonuses won't stack because they have same descriptor which is Natural Armor Enhancement. If you wild shape into an animal and get Natural Armor bonus, then it stacks with Natural Armor Enhancement because they are not the same because of Enhancement description. I know, it is complicated as fuck, that is why I'm trying to explain it here. Only armor class bonus that does stack is with dodge descriptor. Another great way to increase armor class saving throws and attack is through team feats, such as shield wall, shake it off and outflank. It is always great to have outflank on all melee characters. Cavalier class has great ability that can grant whole party any team feat that Cavalier has learned. If playing ranged character, be it bow, wielder or mage that casts spells with ranged attack and ranged touch descriptor, point blank shot and precise shot are must have feats. To get precise shot you first have to get point blank shot. This removes shooting into combat debuff that makes ranged attacks and ranged spells difficult to hit. Now let's talk about spell casting a bit. Important thing to pay attention to is spell resistance, because every enemy and his mama has it. On higher difficulties it becomes an issue. 
Every spell that targets enemy directly or through AoE needs to first pass spell resistance check. If it doesn't, nothing happens. In this case I am casting Bone Shaker which goes through spell resistance of targeted enemy. After spell resistance comes another check which is saving throw, in this case Fortitude. We fail to break through that save because enemy has high fortitude and rolls higher than our DC, which stands for difficulty class. In case of Bone Shaker damage was halved because saving throw check succeeded. Every offensive and debuffing spell has difficulty class and every character, enemy and friendly have saving throws which are fortitude, reflex and will. So how does one go about increasing spell difficulty class? Difficulty class is calculated like this. Caster level plus spell level plus class spell casting attribute plus other modifiers through buffs and items. For example, Dirty Sanchez finger spell over here has high DC for this point in the game and it is 28. We get to that number like this. 13 caster levels plus 7 intelligence modifier plus 7 which is spell level plus 2 from quarter staff. Yeah, I know this should be 29. Maybe it's a bug, no clue. You get the point though. See how this spell didn't have attack roll? That is because it isn't classified as ranged attack or ranged touch attack spell. Now we are going to cast Umbral Strike, which is ranged touch spell. First roll is ranged attack roll and it is basic attack bonus plus dexterity plus dice roll. In this case it is 13 against touch armor of the enemy which is 9 so it is a hit. Then we roll to pass spell resistance. Then difficulty class against saving throw. Enemy managed to pass DC check so it only took half damage from dirty Sanchez finger spell. Feeling dizzy yet? Well, now I'm going to confuse you much more. Look at targeted enemy stat. It says 16 touch armor and 35 flat footed armor, but we rolled against the number 9. Where in the holy ass did that come from? Touch armor is calculated against touch attacks and Dirty Sanchez finger is ranged touch attack. Touch attacks ignore any sort of equipped armor, even natural. Flat footed armor means enemy can't apply dexterity and other bonuses to armor class, so you roll only against equipped armor without added bonuses. Easiest way to apply flat footed condition is to attack enemy from stealth, like I did in the video. So we targeted touch armor and flat footed armor at the same time, meaning we are attacking this colossal bastard without his armor and other bonuses. So 16 minus 7 equals 9 and that is how we got to that number. 7 is his dexterity bonus due to 25 points in dexterity which means plus 7 dexterity modifier. And it is stripped off of that bonus because of flat footed condition that doesn't allow any dexterity and other bonuses such as deflection and dodge to armor class. Now something a bit easier to understand. Every caster class, be it cleric, wizard, sorcerer or whoever has caster levels. One character level equals one caster level. Some classes like Blood Rager grant one caster level per character level, but can't learn spells above level 4, making them inefficient for offensive casting, but good enough to buff themselves. Caster levels don't stack when multiclassing. Look at this example, 7 alchemist and 6 wizard. Alchemist spells will be cast with caster level 7 and wizard spells will be cast with caster level 6. So if you want to become all powerful mage with the ability to cast highest level spells you should avoid multiclassing and put as many points into casting attribute. For wizards that is intelligence, for clerics is wisdom, sorcerers charisma and so on. Now to focus on important mechanic in Pathfinder and that is damage reduction. Most enemies in the game have some kind of DR and most can be negated with specific damage type. At the beginning demons and humans are frequent enemies. 
Demons are immune to electricity and have energy resistance against other types of elemental damage. Big thing when fighting them is their damage reduction against all attacks except good aligned and cold iron weapons. Problem is that most cold iron weapons early on are not magically enhanced with plus one or higher modifiers, so they won't be as effective due to lack of bonuses, but still required to wield against demons. Great way to circumvent issue of having to switch to cold iron weapons is to have a line weapon spell in the party. It is one of the best spells in this game because demons are creatures fought throughout whole story so by having option to align weapon of best DPS character to good or something else if needed is great advantage. There are also other types of DR but they are all fairly easy to understand. For example if it says exception magic that means you can damage enemy normally by using plus one, plus two or higher weapon as they are considered magic. Concealment is another issue that is encountered frequently. It adds percentage to miss chance and can be annoying to deal with. There are a couple of ways to circumvent this. It also depends if enemies are extra planar. Extra planar enemy concealment, usually demons cannot be countered with spells such as true seeing and fairy fire, while other enemy types can be countered with those spells. Best way to counter concealment is through feats improved blind fight for melee and improved precise shot for ranged characters. Echolocation is blind sight spell that helps against such enemies as well. Polymorphing into animals and dragon kind also grants blind sight from what I've read. Use Finian, token weapon that is found in Ancestries and Wonders shop that can be transformed into any weapon with special properties. Use it to your advantage because early on Finian has cold iron property and later ghost touch and probably more. When missing certain weapon that could be very helpful for a number of reasons, don't forget about Finian. Now I'm gonna mention some important defensive spells you need to know about. Anything with communal is pretty much a must. Delay poison, protection against alignment, resist energy, have these in party because they can turn the fight around and make it much easier overall. Summons are great. Having party members with pets and with summoning spells is almost guaranteed success even on hard difficulties. Offensively summons lose effectiveness later on higher difficulties due to low basic attack bonus, but there are more powerful summoning spells later on that offset that a bit. Main benefit of having summons and pets is that enemy is going to target them and not you, so spam them on top of enemies for great success. A great success! Always try to initiate combat from stealth because that leaves enemies flat footed during first round and we talked about flat footed armor earlier, didn't we class? Use stealth to your advantage. By knowing what is up ahead you can start buffing whole party beforehand so that kicking ass commences when at your best. When things kick off use ranged and stealthy characters to pick off spellcaster and ranger enemy types first. They can do massive damage and debuff your team to the point of well unfucked realization. Pathfinder loves level and attribute drain nonsense. Lots of enemies have attribute and level drain nonsense. Negative levels can be countered with restoration spell and attribute damage can be dealt with lesser restoration and restoration. Buy lots of restoration potions and scrolls when embarking on adventure. Throw in some healing potions as well for good measure. Pathfinder has two combat modes, turn-based and real-time with pause. Switching between them can be done anytime. This is a great tool to use to your advantage. 
What I like to do is to start the fight in turn based, to tactically position everyone where I want them, summon annoying pests and inspect enemies in peace to understand what I'm dealing with. After a round or two spent in preparation, I let my bastards loose to have fun by switching to real time with pose. If things turn to shit, switch back to turn based again. Another trick you can do in real time with pause is to slow down time. By holding V or shift plus space everything goes half the normal speed, making combat more manageable. Couple of more things before we conclude the video. Try to arrange party in such a way that there are different main attributes present because they affect skills. Having party proficient in all skills can go a long way in making things easier for you because there are plenty skill checks in the game. Here is a thing I do, cheating a bit I know but fuck it, you decide if you wanna use it. Perception is probably most important skill in the game, it uncovers traps and hidden loot which there is plenty of. By lowering difficulty perception checks are far easier to pass, so after clearing whole area of enemies on desired difficulty, do another pass through to see if there is something hidden you couldn't see at first. Might have to rest before doing another sweep to reset persuasion checks. This is especially useful in Ivory Sanctum, where I've missed some great rewards because of failed perception checks. Game has some nasty difficulty spikes, so don't sweat it if you can't progress. Lower difficulty and try again, no shame in it, because spikes can be nasty. Mythic paths are a big part of the game, but I won't cover them here. Important thing I have to say here is that 6 mythic paths can be unlocked before retaking Dresden. So try to do that because there is big mythic path choice to make after Dresden. Three are unlocked by playing through rest of the game. I might do guide on how to unlock each path, but it might take a while. Enable retrain in difficulty options because it helps tremendously. Build mistakes are gonna be made unless you're D&D veteran, so don't play hero. Don't even know why that is not permanent thing. It should be present all the time, but at least there is respect. Talk to healer to retrain. Anyway, that would be all. Go on, you are ready to play now.